Well, we're back this week, continuing our look at the Princetronic Tournament VC6000. This console from the late 70s, in part one last time, we took a look around the machine, jury rigged the power supply, did a bit of a composite mod, stuck the game in and uh, nothing happened. So since then, I have purchased the official power supply. We'll see if this makes any difference to the behaviour. I do have another game on the way. It hasn't arrived yet. But the other thing that has arrived are some 22k trimmer pots. We need one of these to properly finish off that composite mod. And so I think that's the first thing we will do. Let's open it up and see if we can't get a slightly better video signal out of it. But before we do that, in the last video, I said that our Prince Tronic here was a clone of the Radofin 1292, and that there were multiple clones of that system, including an Ace Tronic, that would be an Ace Tronic MPU 1000 or 2000. In fact, the power supply that I got, it's branded Radofin for the 1292. But in the comments of the last video, Gary Hart, well, he pointed me towards the Wikipedia article for the 1292 Advanced Programmable Video System. And if we just take a quick look at that, you can see here a list of manufacturers that all cloned what was essentially the same looking machine. But if we look at those release years, it would appear that Audiosonic were the first ones to the table with their 1292. If we scroll on down this, you can see that there are other systems, different in appearance, but all of those are the same internally. They're all based on that Signetics chipset. And supposedly all of these systems with those Signetic chips are software compatible. It's just that their cartridges differ slightly, so it may not be possible to use a cartridge from one of those other machines in one that looks like this. In fact, under another comment made by a user with the name Breakfast of Champions, so I can only assume full fat coke and packet of potato, cheese and onion. Well, it seems that they did a bit of research into the design of this system. It was apparently designed by Philips, who then made a deal with Intel and decided to sell the chipset to Signetics. And I can only assume that the basis for what's inside here was designed by Signetics and then sold off to all these various manufacturers. So this is the composite mod that we did last time. I was following a mod that I found online by the Nightfall crew. I'll link it in the description again. They used a 22k trim pot, but last time I didn't have one of those, so I stuck this 4.7k resistor in line from that point. And while we did get a video signal, well, as you can see, it was a bit rough. I do now have the trim pots that we need. So let's get that out of there. The middle leg of our trim pot gets connected at that point. We need to feed ground into one of the others and then the other one will be the output. Well, that's it fitted. Let's see if it improves the picture. I've obviously disconnected the Molex connector that we were using last time to give us power. We have the genuine PSU now, so we may as well just use that. Let's see what happens. Um, no signal. I did hear a pop out of the speakers. So that would make me think we're getting power. Let's just check quickly with the meter. So yeah, there's five volts, or well, 4.8. A little low, but should be okay. And 12 volts, or 11.4, also a little low. But I would have thought we should have seen something on the screen. Maybe I need to tweak this a little bit with the screwdriver. And indeed, there we are. So that does look a bit brighter, doesn't it? 
Let's just try on power cycle. This time we're getting a grey background. I don't remember seeing that before. Grey and then it goes black. Is that normal behaviour? Let's just quickly put the cartridge in, see if that makes any difference. Nope, still doesn't seem to be doing very much. It is stuck on that grey screen. And there's an awful lot of jail bars in that image, isn't there? Well, that's certainly different again, isn't it? We are seeing some activity there, are we? Is it trying to load the cartridge? It definitely didn't do any of this last time. So maybe we did need the genuine power supply. In terms of video signal though, well, it does have those jail bars on it. Let's see if I can tweak that a bit further. Mm, can't really get rid of them. Wonder if I added a capacitor in here. Would that smooth the video signal? Those jail bars might be caused by some noise on our video signal and adding a cap might eliminate that. Let me try that. So I have added a 220 UF 35 volt capacitor and with just a little bit more tweaking on this well you can see that those jail bars are now gone and we have a nice bright video signal. Although granted I still can't get the machine to do very much at all. There's that garbled screen again. Notice how our four zeros have moved to the bottom of the screen. That would almost make me think that it is trying to load something off the cartridge. Has it gone black again? And with those bits of red on it. Little bit of movement on the screen. Is that the game trying to run? You know, one of the other comments from the last video was that some of the solder joints look a bit dodgy, especially here around the cartridge slot. There obviously has been quite a bit of rework on the bottom of this board in the past. What I'm going to do quickly is just go over any of this rework that has been done. And I think I'll go over the CPU and the PVI. And I'm just going to reflow all of that again. So I've been over and reflowed everything. The game cartridge is in. Let's just see if this makes any difference. Well, we're still getting that black screen. With just our four zeros on it. And try power cycle on a couple of times. So a little bit of activity there, but that's still definitely not a game. Yeah, it's pretty much just doing exactly the same thing as it did earlier. One thing that concerns me slightly is that the reset doesn't seem to be working. So the reset on this machine or well, the way this machine is meant to work anyway, or at least the way I think it's meant to work, you stick the cartridge in, you power it on, and then you push this button here, load program. And that effectively resets the CPU. But as I press that, well, you can see it does absolutely nothing to what is on the screen. So I'm worried that we might actually have a hardware fault, and that that fault might be in the CPU. Let's just take a closer look at that reset line. So it comes into pin 16 on the chip and as pin 16 there comes up that trace. In fact I found schematics for this system or should I say I found schematics for one of those other clones that we uh, seen listed in the wiki. Although granted not fair to call it a clone it's just another machine that uses the Signetics chipset but it is very similar. So these are schematics for the Volt Mace database. You can see the processor there, the programmable video interface. And from the CPU, pin 16 labeled reset. Well, you can see that it is a rather manual affair. Just the switch, and then there's a 4.7K pull down resistor. So if I turn this on, you can see that that is indeed logic low. And then if I push the reset, it goes high. 
So it's not like our reset switch isn't working, but as you seen a second ago on the screen, pushing that switch does absolutely nothing. I would have expected that to maybe blank the screen or take us back to that black screen perhaps with just the four zeros on the top of it. But since nothing changes, well, I'm worried that we have a fault. And one other thing that's making me think we have a fault is that if we take a look at these pins here, these are the data bus. So say we're just going to one of these and if I turn the machine on, well, yes, you can see a bit of activity there and then it stops. Let's try another one. So a bit of activity and then it stops. This time it's stuck high. But these ones down here, this is the address bus. And if I go on to any one of those, turn the machine on. Well, nothing. The entire address bus is floating. So that would point to a faulty component. But if you go back to those schematics, well, the only thing that's really on the data bus or the address bus is the CPU, the PVI, and the cartridge. Yes, okay, on the data bus, there's also that 74LS378, which appears to be involved with generating the sound. And looking on down through these schematics, well, there's another 74LS. 258 and 74LS156 also sitting on the address and data bus. That's those two chips there, I believe, and those are related to our joysticks. But considering that the entire address bus is floating, well, to my mind, reading these schematics, it is the CPU that is driving that. So it unfortunately seems as if we have a problem. Now, you never know, it still might be a dodgy cartridge. The cartridge is connected to everything and perhaps the ROM chip in there is screwed up so much that it's pulling everything down. Well, the other cartridge is finally here. Invaders, obviously a Space Invaders clone. And this cart is labeled Prince Tronic Tournament VC6000. But look at that, that is a sticker. That's been stuck over the top of this other big sticker. And I dare say if we peeled that off, it probably says Astronic underneath it. But let's see if this magically fixes things. Okay. I think the console is meant to power up like that. And then we're meant to press load program. But that's doing absolutely nothing. Power cycling it. There's our corruption again. So there has to be something wrong. I fear it is pointing towards the two Signetics chips, but given my track record over the last couple of repairs, well, I've been tripped up a couple of times by dodgy 74 series logic. There are only one, two, three, four, five of those chips on here. So I think what I'll do is just pull them out and we can test them using the TL866. But it's also a really good excuse to try out my new desoldering gun. Still a Duratool part, and the desoldering station itself, well, that's still the same. I just bought a new gun for it, because the old one, well, it just wasn't sucking very well anymore. This bit of it here had broke, but to be honest with you, I think it was just so well used that it was time to get a new one anyway. They've changed the design of this, as anyone familiar with the old one might recognise, but let's see how it works.
Well, yes, our new desoldering gun certainly did the job. I rather like the new uh, design of this gun. Definitely fits in your hand better. Um, the new button, a bit more clicky operation on it. I approve. But what about our logic chips? So let's start with this one here. This is a 74LS156M. And then on the computer, you can see I've already selected the chip. 74156. And test. Do we have a bad chip straight away? Isn't it just as well I tested this? Now that 74156, it sits here on address lines A0, A1, A3 and A4. But could that be in bad? Obviously it would have an effect on those four address lines, but could that affect the entire address bus? Let's try the next one of our chips. In fact, so that I don't forget where these go, just let me put that back in there. So select our chip, 74258, and test. That one's good. 74LS74. And again, we have a bad chip. 74LS378. Seems as if we have another bad one. I wasn't expecting to find all this. But given that our machine definitely isn't working, I suppose is it any surprise really? Ah, that's not actually a bit of 7.4 series. That's an LM324N. I don't know if this thing can test that. And it doesn't seem as if it can. But given the amount of other failures in here, I mean, out of our four logic chips, three of them are dead. You know, maybe there are faults in everything in here. So three dead components and three good new ones. You'll notice I have fitted sockets under everything that we removed. And since there only was one more chip, that one decided, let's just remove it and put a socket under that as well. Didn't want that boy being left out. So, new 156 goes in there. Paying attention to pin 1 up in this corner. The 7474 goes into that position. Again with pin 1 to the right. And then the 378 goes into this position. But this time pin 1 is to the left. So, power on. And this time we're just getting a white screen. Pressing the load program button does nothing. Let me power cycle a couple of times. Now we're getting nothing other than a white or black screen. Make sure I have this cartridge positioned properly because as you might be able to see, there is quite a bit of play in it when it's just in the board like this. You really need the uh, cartridge slot to position this properly. So no, just a white screen, but is there anything happening around the CPU? Well, there's our data bus again, seemingly pulsing away. The address bus on the other side though, well, nothing happening. I think it's looking more and more likely that we have a fault in the CPU. Or I suppose the PVI. Whenever one of these is running everything, and well, you would assume it is the CPU. The problem is though, the only place you're going to get replacements for these is in another console. Just like this. Oh yes, we are well and truly invested now, because I bought another one. Although granted, this one looks to be in worse condition than our little Prince Tronic here. Somebody's had the cables off the back of it. 
And you might notice that this one is entitled the Astronic MPU-1000. It is pretty much identical though. So I'm going to pull the CPU and the PVI out of this. We'll drop them into our Prince Tronic here. And that really is going to be the last roll of the dice. There's the CPU and the PVI. We will swap them into here in a minute. But there is one subtle difference between these two, which I thought was a little bit interesting anyway. This board is also labelled the Radofin XAM2050, but it's missing the 7474. Rather, instead, there's two jumper links in here. So obviously just a minor revision there. But other than that, they look identical. And in fact, the cartridge port on this one, it looks to be in better condition than the cartridge port here. The pins inside that don't look as bent out of shape as the pins inside this one do. So maybe something else to consider, swap those over. But let's get the CPU and the PVI in here, swap those two chips out, and let's see if that makes the difference. Okay, chip's in, game is in, let's see what happens. Um, I've swapped back to the original PVI, and if we power it on now, well, we're just getting a black screen, but if we take a look at the address bus on the CPU, just any one of the lines, see the way it's stuck high? Previously with the other CPU, it was floating. So I think that's a good sign. If we try and reseat this cartridge, and power cycle a few times, well, we now have some activity on the screen. And if we take a look at this address bus again, well, it's now pulsing away, as is the data bus. And when it does generate a screen, it will stay like that. Whereas previously with the other CPU, if it was generating a screen, we had nothing whatsoever on the address bus. And the data bus would eventually always die. And in fact, if we're really lucky, just like that, one more power cycle, and that indeed is this game. The number 8 at the top, that represents the game that it is trying to run. Track racing, well that's numbers 5 through 10, and that looks like a track to me. Unfortunately though, pressing any of the buttons does very little. So I thought maybe we had a bad connection on the cartridge port. Swapped over to this one off the other board, just because this one was in better condition, but no, that didn't really make any difference. And then I don't know what made me check it, but on closer inspection to our ribbon cable, which I have now removed from the board, you can see that the wire on the end, that's broke off. This third one in here, that's partly broke, and this one was bent actually out of the board. I have no idea how that happened, other than perhaps me manhandling the board in and out of this case. This has become damaged. So let me fix this, and then we'll test it again. Okay, that's now fixed, but to be honest, I just took the lazy option. Just took the front panel and ribbon out of the other machine and stuck that in here instead. When I started trying to repair the original one, I had noticed the ribbon had actually broke off on the front panel section as well, so easier just to swap the whole thing. And I've stuck the board back in the case, just to be sure that our cartridge slot lines up properly. So, come on, let's test it. Let's see if it now works. Power on. Black screen, okay. Load program. Is it working? 
if we press game select you see that number one in the top right corner well there's 10 games on this cartridge that should cycle through that oh yes oh yes I think we have a working system fantastic so game one and two are grand prix game one there presumably two player game two looks like it's single player let's give that a go shall we game start and there it is now, I'm not sure which one of these is player one I assume it's that one and that is ridiculously sensitive so we've got left and right up seems to accelerate and I assume we're meant to try and avoid all these other cars And it seems as if every time we clear a screen, the right hand number increments by one. And every time I crash into something, the left hand number, that jumps up by one. I apparently hit 23, four cars, five cars in my way. But it certainly seems as if our machine is working. What other games have we got? What's this? Rally? So we presumably need to stay between the lanes. And then we've got track. How do we control this now? Is that like tank controls? So up to accelerate. Yeah, I definitely think our joystick needs a little bit of attention. Because surely it's not meant to be this hard to control. What about invaders? Power on, black screen, that must be how it works. Then load program. And there indeed it is. So 10 games again. Well, I think so anyway. Might only be 8 actually. 1 through 4 is day invasion. And then 5, 6, 7 and 8. That's night assault. There is 10. Oh, there's 16. 9 through 16 is as above but without protective barriers, right? And right enough, the protective barriers have disappeared. So, four daytime missions, although it's red this time, and then nighttime missions, and it's purple. Let's just try this, will we? One player laser cannons. So yeah, the sensitivity on this obviously needs adjusted because it's very sensitive going right. But we need to go nearly the whole way over to make it go left. Can we shoot? How do we shoot? Hmm. Doesn't seem as if the buttons are doing anything. Let me try one of the two player games. Okay, yeah, so that seems to be player two now. But this time our joystick is not working at all. But we can fire. So it looks like the next thing we need to do 
Let's open these up and see why they're not working. So just two screws to hold these together and then a lot of clips around the outside. The buttons are indeed the same as those on the front panel of the machine. And the joystick looks like a little analog stick. In fact, I would say that's exactly what it is. Those look like two potentiometers. Surely it must be one of the very first analog sticks, given the age of this thing. But the problems, and as I suspected, are being caused by broken wires. So on this pad, this is the one that the joystick worked, but there was no action from the buttons. And that's because two of the wires here are broken. That red wire, I have the meter in continuity. That red wire isn't making any continuity through to the board. Now if we check one of the other ones, that's fine, but the red is broken, as is the grey one on the end here. Yep, nothing there. And certainly looking at the layout of the traces, well the red wire, the trace from that, seems to run to all of the buttons. So at a guess, 5 volts coming into this. Then you know you're pushing the button, creating the circuit, sending that five volts back out down one of these other wires, and that's your button press. Obviously, with that missing, this ain't going to work. On the other one, then it is pretty much the same story, although the missing wire this time is on the joystick, and that probably explains why in Space Invaders our character ship just moves straight over to the right hand side and stayed there. I couldn't control it. But on this pad, all of the wires running to the buttons, they're all fine. And it was on this one that we were able to shoot. It's a 10 core cable. So I'll probably end up ordering something to replace these with. Because I can't think of any spare cables that I have that would have 10 cores in them. Well, I'm going to have to order some 10 core cable. I had a look about the cave here and I don't have anything suitable. If it had to be 9 cores, then we would have been fine because I have any amount of old Atari style joysticks. They're all 9 core. But we need 10, so I'll have to order something and just repair those at a later date. For now though, I think we have done more than enough today. The machine itself works. So in total we had 4 bad chips. The 374 series logic and the CPU. Now perhaps it's just dumb luck that in that other machine I bought, the Acetronic, well I bought that to take the two Signetics chips out of. And it seems I was just lucky that the CPU from that worked because the PVI from it is definitely cooked. I tried it again in our Princetronic here and you just get a black screen with that solid tone. So maybe if anyone is looking at one of these machines and has that fault, well, you might have a bad PVI. But that's it for now. We have one working console. I have two joysticks to repair. When I do get round to that, I'll just stick a post on Twitter or something just to let you know how it went. But for now, hopefully you enjoyed this video. And if you did, I would appreciate a big thumbs up why not hit subscribe if you haven't done so already? Still plenty more yet to come here on CRG and I'll see you next time.